pockets. Um, oh yeah, they do. Auto -grab. Auto -grab. show you how yeah. it goes. If, when you package it up in your pocket, you want it just through the inside loop, and that's it for right now. Inside loop, and then just pull it back over itself, probably about eight, nine inches, and then all you gotta do is fold it in half. That way it's set up for one arm. If I, pull this, if I take around the one arm, I can pull this out of my pocket, and it just my arm slides right into it. And then I can cinch it down from there. But to put it on, put it on your arm, leg, whatever, whatever, on extremity, you're going to put it on and put it up as high as you can, no matter where the wound's at. Rather, no matter where the wound's at, put it as high as you can. Grab the end here, and we tighten it down. You always want to make sure you keep this windlass, this rod here, reachable, because that's going to be what you use to, to cinch it up. So once you get that through as tight as you can with the Velcro, just push it back on itself. <laughs> Push it back on itself. I mean, if you get it really tight with just the Velcro, you probably won't get more than a full turn out of the, the rod here. And if they had some kind of major bleeding, some kind of arterial or life-threatening bleed, um, put this thing on and you just tighten this down to the bleeding stops. Um, I can get, there's a half turn. God, there's a full turn. And you want, I mean, there's no pulse. You have to stop all bleeding. Not just the bright red, but everything, period. Um, and you can leave these things on for a long, long time. And we'll, I'll show you more detail when we, when we look at some of the pictures on there. But once you get it tightened down, you lock it in. So either clip, depending which way you're going, bring that back through, and then this can go over top. That way, if you're moving, you're running, you're shooting, whatever, it keeps that locked in there so that clip can't come back out and pop off. These are going in the bag, or well, there's one in the in the pouch here mm -hmm. that's going to be there for the for the pack here, but he's also going to give you one for just regular duty that you can carry in one of the cargo pockets of your uniform, so that actually, in in an active shooter situation, if you load up with the ballistic carrier over top of your soft body armor. And if you obviously, if you're carrying the one he gives you with you, you're going to actually have two of them. So if need be. Now the only difference is with these, always, and I'm hoping that guys will consciously uh, once issued these carry them on duty. If you find yourself in a situation where you're going to uh, apply a tourniquet to an officer that's down, use his tourniquet. Does that make, make sense? Like if, if, you know, just routine patrol thing, somebody takes one and you're going to, you know, you see the need to apply a tourniquet to them, use the tourniquet out of their cargo pocket and put it on them. That way, you know, you still have one for yourself if you need it. You know, you're always going to try and carry yours. Use their stuff on them. Same with this, you know, if they happen to have this gear on also, you know, pull it out of the front of their vest. Or, same goes with the other stuff, if you're going to use that as really bandage or, you know, any of the quick clot stuff or the chest thing, pull it out of their med kit off of their gear. Always save your own gear for you. All Port Huron PD will be carrying these in one of their cargo pockets. And I was telling Port Huron PD this morning. Uh, that you guys will most likely okay. be doing the same thing. So if you guys are up there, they're down here, it's a mutual understanding of where these things are going to be um, and everyone knows how to use them. When you're putting it on your leg, same thing. The, the general rule of thumb is if I'm using one hand to put this on, I only go through one loop on the buckle. If I'm using two hands to put this on on somebody else's arm or on my leg, I have to go through both loops of the buckle. When you put this on, you can leave it in the loop or you can undo it completely. And the same thing it has to be up as high as you can get it. Through the second loop, and the easiest thing is to push down here. When I tighten it, otherwise it just goes right around the leg. And it becomes a pain in the butt. Put it back on itself, and same thing, start cinching it down. And on the leg, you... You basically, you get it as tight as you can get it, basically, yeah. until it hurts. Yeah, when you're training like this, 
I don't have anything to go off of because I'm not bleeding. But in real life, you keep cinching that thing down until all the bleeding stops and locking it right there. I mean, it's that simple. Go ahead and try it. Try it on your, your weak arm, your, your, your leg. Give it a few shots because I think the arm. The, the arm is, is pretty easy. Doing it one-handed is, I think, actually a little bit easier than two-handed going through the leg. You can get that higher, break up into your yeah. armpit a little bit, get it higher. But and just to give everybody a fair warning, um, after I went through and saw this and how they worked and everything on Monday, uh, I fully plan to uh, borrow these things when we go to the indoor range for combat pistol shooting, and I'm going to throw that right in. I'm going to put, uh, everybody's going to have one of these trainers in their cargo pocket, and at some point during a uh, thing on the line, I'm going to say, you just took a shot, took a round to your strong arm. Get behind cover on the time people and, you know, to get a tourniquet on, on their strong arm, and then continue shooting the uh, course of fire with the weak hand. And that would include reloads and everything so that you know what you can do one-handed. Uh, these, these things are really, really good and simple, but it does take some practice. you gotta, you got to practice with it and see, um, see how it works. We were practicing with, with them today, and we gave them 20-second... Are you busy? We gave them a 20-second time frame to when we called out whatever extremity it was that they had to have it completely tight. Thirteen twenty one county domestic. Changes things. Oh, oh, oh. I'm old. High as you can go. High as you can get it. Yeah. Twenty. Yeah, push down on there. And you gotta go through both loops when you're on your leg. Four one nine. Put through both loops right now. Originally was nine one hang up call on the cell phone. Didn't make contact with two separate females. Advising there's a male subject on location causing a problem. They are not cooperating with me. Refuse to tell me his name. You, you guys, I wouldn't worry about it. No, I mean, because you're using these when it hits the fan, and we're not concerned with the exact amount of time. We're going to have a general idea in the last two hours that you're going to be spending on the It's not a huge deal. The last thing I want you guys to worry about is what do I write on this? You know. One of the lowest yeah. in the tourniquet, you know, yeah. inside just for duty. Alright, so I know. Yeah, I do want to do one or one yeah. of those goals. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Sorry, yeah. someone. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's from the yeah. yeah. every day. Yeah. 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 Put it in the inside one. Yeah. Bring it through probably about eight inches or so. Yeah. And then put it back onto itself. Can you see if you can locate that? Just line it up with. Yeah. And then just fold it in half. And it goes in. Yeah, then it goes in the pocket. The one design flaw, I think, they put this red tab on there to be highly visible so you see where it is. But what I don't like is they put Velcro on the back of it. Well, so let me you, ask, and I agree with you completely as I, far as the whole dexterity thing goes, but let me ask you this. How well, tough would it be? In there. I'm, sure, I'm, there. I'm sure if you, if you made any... Uh, Modifications to that is probably going to uh, null and void any void kind any of a liability yeah. or warranty yeah. that the manufacturer has or whatever. But I mean, how tough would it be to like just break the uh, break the seam and cut that little piece of velcro off? So it's just the red tabs. I would. I'd probably just I'd sand down that plastic right on that side. Put a piece of tape. Yeah. Put a piece of tape over the velcro. Yeah, because that's the one thing I like some gorilla tape. You know, something that's going to hold on that. Yeah. I fold my. I got a roll of that at home. It's up to you guys if you want to, but I fold my tab in so I can. I got something to, to really grab onto. Flip, cool. it, flip it around the other way. Yeah. If you can keep this, the white tab up when you put it on, it makes it a lot easier um, on you when you're trying to put it on because then, yeah, you get stuck around the back side. If it is dense, let it extend uh, 42756. Right. He has one on the left. If you pull it off your arm and put it on, put it in the other way, yeah, now slide your arm in that way. And always keep, when you're tightening it up, try and keep that rod right where you're going to be able to reach it the whole time. And, and yeah, you 
either way. It doesn't yeah, matter doesn't which matter. way you're, you turn it. Bring that through. Yep. Yeah. Doesn't have to do yeah. pretty. Just get it out of the way. Out of the way and that's it. Check its pulse. Make sure you're still alive. I don't think it twisted it enough. No, I don't. No. Not much there. Yeah. Not much so there. you probably you look where I touched his. Take his my blood pressure now. Take yeah. my you can see in the back of his hand that the blood flow. Yeah. Ideally, you you probably real life would want to give that one more try. Take one blood pressure now. I'll yeah. Get my pills. <laughs> Fine. But for, for an arm, one loop through the buckle is just fine. It leg is going to go through. Leg, yeah. you have to go through both because the pressure it takes to, to cinch off the leg with the thigh muscle and things like that, um, can you the Velcro can't hold that kind of pressure. Um, so you have to go I'll through both the buckles so it actually has something to, to kind of cinch down on. Um, with some people's legs, depending if they're very muscular or, or just bigger, uh, you might have to put two tourniquets on. If the first one doesn't work, leave it there. Put another one right next to it. Um, so it just depends. Um, let's see. I, just a few pictures on here to show you a few different things. With, with your work with the, the morgue in that, I'm sure you've seen quite a, a bit of different bleeding in that. Um, instead of ABCs for uh, when we think about patient care or victims or anything like that, this is what they want to go to is this MARCH acronym. ABCs is good for medical patients, and that's about it, okay? Um, with March, the biggest thing is I, I need to stop that massive hemorrhaging right off the bat. Um, it's great. I could get the best airway ever on this guy, but everything that he needs to deliver that oxygen is laying out in the street, okay? If I don't start the bleeding, nothing else matters. Um, three types of bleeding, capillary bleeding, I skin my knee, a capillary bleeding, um, very small, or capillaries, very small blood vessels. Venous bleeding is a deeper into the tissues. I get the veins and then I get that dark red blood. Um, usually direct pressure will take care of that. Uh, it might require more, but it's not very common. Um, but what we're looking at is arterial bleeding. You get that bright, bright red blood, um, arterial bleeding all over, that's gonna require a tourniquet. Especially if you're in a tactical environment or if there's some kind of threat and you've got any major bleeding on an extremity, Put that tourniquet on there and be done with it. You don't have time to worry about bandaging up and using all this fancy crap. Just put a tourniquet on it and be done with yeah, it. You know, when you get to cover or when the situation's over, whatever, now I can worry about bandaging yeah, it. They did not give um, me one. And making it look pretty. This guy here is from the Boston Marathon um, bombing. Um, this gentleman here is actually still alive. Um, and still alive today. Survived. Um, both the bottom of his legs being blown off, even though no one in the photo is helping him. They're all helping everybody else around him. Um, but one guy came up to him, the guy in a cowboy hat is Carlos, I believe is his name, walks up to him, sees what's going on, um, and he actually has the, the guts to, to actually help out somebody with, with those kind of wounds. Um, and the only thing he did is what's in his right hand right there is that guy's femoral artery. He walked up to him, saw this thing spitting out blood like crazy, and the, the only thing he did was that. Save that guy's life by that simple, simple maneuver. Um, no, necessary, no medical equipment, no training, nothing. He, he, he saw the, the bleeding and he stopped it right away. Um, with bleeding, if there's no threat, we, we kind of use this setup. I'm going to try direct pressure first. If that doesn't work, I'm going to slowly ramp up my efforts until the bleeding stops, tourniquet being my last step. Um, if there's a threat, those things kind of change, but for the most part, um, with direct pressure, we played a lot with this today with the, the dummies when we were doing scenarios. If you, got, if you come up on somebody and, and there's possibly still a threat or you want to keep your attention there and there's a wound bleeding heavily, drop your knee into it. Drop your knee into that person. It takes no effort for me to let my body weight sit on my knee. And I put a lot of pressure on that person's wound. And I still have my whole upper body to move around, to look around, to, to treat other wounds, to do whatever. My whole upper body is still completely um, available. Where if you're using your hand, you're using your fingers, whatever, um, to push pressure on there, you will fatigue very, very quickly on how much pressure you can push with your arms and hands and will eventually start to let up on that. Um, so just think of those things when we're holding, you know, we're holding pressure on a wound. Um, what do I need to do to, to kind of take care of this right now? The Israeli bandage. These things are really, really cool. They're slick. 
These things are packaged, they're vacuum sealed. A lot smaller than you would think. That's what it looks like in the packaging. And there's actually, it's in two bags, which is kind of annoying. Um, but these Israeli dressings are really, really cool. You open them up, it's an ace wrap, it's a bandage, and they've got this pressure applicator on there. And it can hold up to 30 pounds of pressure or more. There's different things that we can do to really, really ramp up the pressure. But if I have a wound somewhere, on me or on somebody else, put that section directly over top of the wound. Put this thing, wrap it around once, or twice, or it really doesn't matter. Put it through the pressure bar, and then back the other way. And that pressure bar now pushes pressure directly on top of the wound. And I just wrap it up like I would an ace wrap. Show him how he can... If you want to put more pressure on it, when you get to the bar each time, you can twist the wrap and put that twist over top of, of the bar. Like yep. just, yeah, you can just twist it, yeah. put a half yeah. twist in it, and, and every time you come over that bar, you can keep putting a half twist, and that just increases the pressure. And then, yeah, open it up, and, and yeah, yeah, let it go flat, and yeah. you can you go know, one low, one high, and whatever you want to do with these. These things are so versatile, I mean, it, it's amazing. But then when you get out to the end... When you got to the end, if this controlled the bleeding, yeah, great. Clip it on some of the open areas, you're done. You got your if you want even more pressure, find the last few loops that you went through. You can stick this up underneath and, and start twisting it just like a tourniquet. Yeah, they have one mil it won't achieve the same pressure that a tourniquet can, but if I just need a little bit more pressure to keep that bleeding stop, I can do that, twist it, and then when I'm done, I can hook it back up. They're out with him at Alexander's at this time. Those go on relatively quickly also. Oh my gosh. And if you've got uh, halfway, uh, if you've applied that, you know, halfway uh, accurately, uh, they're not going anywhere. No. You, you could get up and move and... Well, I'm eyes on the other one. Yeah, 23 and 26, apparently well. the subject of Alexander's I was, was not taught at SMR the other day, the first day, they're, they're still there. talking about a back there, first aid case, and they're kind of laughing sometimes, and saying, you know what, go on the internet and get some of these. Is that our Alexander's? No, uh, well that's what I mean, I don't know where, because it's two county cars they just sent. Right, they're trying to tell their own. Ideally though, with these rake, when you're applying it, you treat it like an ace bandage. You want to keep it rolled up. It's easier to manipulate. Yeah. If you let yeah. it, if you let it unravel while you're still applying it, no, go the other way, opposite okay. direction, to let that pressure bar dig in. And that's this is where you want to pull it tight. Yeah. The moment you let go of that roll, it just gets it, it still works, but it gets a lot more difficult. So. And then if I want. And these things can be used Our legs, 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 head, neck. Um, if, if you're doing a head or even or you ankle the, uh, and you want to change direction, when you loop around the next time, swing it around that pressure bar, and now you can go the opposite direction. They are very, very, very well. Well. Especially, I mean, like head and neck. Working in an ambulance, the trying to put pressure on somebody's head, the it's just a pain head. in the butt, you know, because you can't just tape it right to their head all the time. It, it's kind of hard. This, this thing's going to be awesome. Um, to use a neck and like a neck, uh, neck wound. Yeah, you can't go around you the neck. You can't just wrap around the neck. Pressure, but it'll show you. If you put this thing, if I got a neck wound, as long as it's not directly um, in the front, um, if I put this on the neck wound, put it here, and then wrap underneath the opposite arm, I, to do it to myself is not going to work. Um, but wrap it underneath that opposite arm so I'm not blocking off their airway or anything, and then same thing, through the pressure bar back the other way, I can put pressure on a neck wound um, relatively easy, because uh, otherwise you're going to have to sit there and manually hold it the entire time. Well, I think when you show up on my scene, you'll realize why I didn't become a fireman. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's the problem is we can't get on scene a lot of times with, with some of this stuff. You know, if it's still, if the scene's not secure, we might be sitting down the street um, just waiting. Um, so, you know, we count on you guys to, to at least have a pretty good head start on us for, for self-care. Um, it's just like CPR. If no one does anything before we get there, 
um, chances of survival go down pretty sharply. Um, but if you guys can throw a tourniquet on there, start doing something before we get there, uh, things go much, much better. Did you show me our work? Oh, one-handed application. Oh, I got to, let me look at the video here. This video shows some different ideas here. Four, six, one. Of how to put this on. I don't really have sound on it, but you can, you can see. Can you text my partner, sir? Uh, those are six inch, I think. Um, I think the one he's using is at least eight. The trainers, those two also, they've got little teeth that dig in once you wrap it up to hold it there, but I filed them all down on the trainer so it doesn't keep ripping them up every time we use them. Every time he goes over that bar, he's twisting it. Until I saw the video, I never even realized that loop was at the end. You see, there's a little loop. Yeah. So that it makes it would make it easier for you to do this one-handed. Now that if you're using this, this isn't a, a life-threatening bleed. This life-threatening bleed, put a tourniquet on it and just be done. Um, you can make it pretty later. This is for, you know, moderate bleeding, but nothing that we're really too concerned about. Here's the head wrap. This, like I said, I, I haven't had to use it yet on a, a head injury, but it, I mean, these things are going to work really, really well. And they're cheap. I think they're $8 a piece. And there's, that's really nothing. Having that bar there to be able to change directions, I mean, really kind of frees you up um, to do whatever you want. Place the you have dominoes the same as all the others. A um, little more detail with the cat tourniquet. Like I said, we twist that thing until all blood flow stops, period. I don't want to leave it trickling or, or just do it until the bright red blood stops, until everything stops. We can leave these things on for hours. Hours and hours and hours. Um, in Civil War, we got a tourniquet's kind of bad rap because they were using really thin material. They'd use wire and, and small cord and shoestring, all sorts of things to tie a tourniquet. Well, that digs into the tissues, it digs into the arteries, and creates damage. And the, yeah, they lost their limb because of it. Um, and we believe that up through World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, Korean War, we believe that, and so we never used it. Finally, we get into the Second Iraq War. You know, and, and here we're in the 21st century and people are still dying from gunshot wounds to their knees. They're like, this is a stupid problem to have, okay? And so they went back, revisited tourniquets, and, and come to find out it's not as bad as we thought. The main thing is, is the width of the tourniquet. These things are at least an inch wide, and so it displaces that weight and doesn't create the damage like the really thin material does. Um, so, yeah, you can wear these things. They say... If you can control it no more than two hours, but they've had tons and tons of cases um, in the war right now where they're leaving them on for 10, 12 hours and these people are still having very, very little side effects after. The only side effects that they really reported um, in most cases is some kind of palsy in that limb or some kind of twitch in that limb for like a couple months and then it usually goes away. So hey, when it comes to my life, I'll take any risk. 
I'll take any risk uh, is better than losing, losing your life. Um, like again, we go high and tight because of our anatomy. Even if, I, if the bleeding is down at the wrist or in the lower forearm, I'm going to go as high as I can each and every time because it's a lot easier to cinch off blood flow when that artery sits just up against one bone. I can push it up against that bone, cinch it down, and the bleeding's done. Where down in my lower arm, I have a bone that runs on each side, and the arteries and muscles are all in between, and so that makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, the same with the leg, one bone up top, two bones in the bottom. Um, the other reason being is your arteries are under tension, and if the artery gets severed completely, it can draw back up in, into the body. And so if, if I have a wound, let's say for the knee, our old teaching was we put a tourniquet two to three inches above it, I put my tourniquet here, what happens is that artery is retracted enough, it can start bleeding above the tourniquet and I can bleed internally and still have the same problem. So every time, as high as you can, tighten it down, take care of the bleeding um, right away. It's going to cause pain. It's going to be painful for this person, they're just going to have to deal with it. Okay, we are saving their life, we're not too concerned about their comfort um, as of yet. When you put on the thigh, like I said, it might require two tourniquets. But we have to go through both loops on that buckle when we put it on a leg. It's just too much pressure for the, the Velcro to hold on to. Um, as their blood pressure comes back up, you have somebody with a significant leg wound, they've got bleeding, their blood pressure initially is going to drop. So your body can start to control what's going on. As you put that tourniquet on and you stop that bleeding, their blood pressure will start to recuperate and rise. So just watch that wound that it doesn't start re-bleeding. As their blood pressure gets back up near normal, if it starts re-bleeding, tighten it down a little bit more. Stop the bleeding and go from there. So these things are awesome because once you tighten them down, you can continue to tighten them, pull the windlass back out, tighten it up a little bit more, pop it back in. Um, you can continue to, to keep doing that. Don't take it off. The moment, Once you put it on, leave it. Don't take it off and let us make that decision. We're probably going to let the hospital make that decision, okay? Because the moment I take it off, there's so many other aspects I have to worry about of what might happen. And if we're not ready or prepared for those, uh, it could be bad. So we're, as a medic, I'm saying I'm probably going to let the, the ER worry about that. That's not going to be my concern. Um, we talked about that. How long does it take you to bleed to death? from a femoral artery and vein disruption or a complete uh, severing, it, little as 90 seconds. That's worst case scenario, 90 seconds, bleed to death. Um, I, I was actually teaching at SMR yesterday and told a lady there, you know, I said, hey, you've got the machinery here that could you know, cause major bleeding. Um, even the femoral artery said, it, it's a minute and a half and you could die. And she's like, I don't believe you. So I got a video that'll prove you wrong. You know, and so that's what we've got here. Um, I don't know what country this is in, or why this guy deserved this, but what happens is he takes two AK rounds, one through his thigh, uh, one through his arm, and, and they let him bleed to death. You know, it's a sad video, but to see how fast this, this can actually happen. This whole video is just under a minute. He's already getting tired, he's already getting dizzy, slipping in and out of consciousness. He's got it, probably close to a liter out on the, on the ground already. He's still awake, that doesn't mean he's with it. He's confused. He's weak, and finally, when he starts getting dizzy again, he gives up. That's game over. He's done. In that little amount of time, um, he's done for. Um, so when we talk about, you know, practicing with these tourniquets, training, 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 time is a huge factor uh, because. It, What's your enemy shooting at? The same thing you are. Body mass, right? Well, everything just on the edges of all your body armor are all these main arteries, okay? Your legs, your, your junctional areas where everything meets um, your torso. And so, you know, from when you get shot,
to when you realize you've been hit, oh my gosh, I need to grab my tourniquet, what side's it on, start clearing your head, you're talking probably 15, 20 seconds just there. And in 15, 20 seconds, that guy had almost a liter out on the ground already. Like I said, worst case scenario, but if, if you don't prepare for worst case scenario, we want to make sure we're, we're always ready. Uh, just some examples of stuff I don't need a tourniquet for. Okay, That can be controlled uh, by direct pressure um, or the Israeli bandaging. Junctional hemorrhaging. What would worry me more than having to use a tourniquet is trying to stop something like this in an area I can't put the tourniquet. Okay, Anywhere with a where the junctional areas, the groin, uh, the base of the neck, the armpits, anywhere your um, extremities meet your torso is where your arteries start to come from deeper in the torso, come closer to the skin, and we get those massive, those dangerous areas. Um, and so we have to start looking at how do I stop this bleeding without a tourniquet? How do I stop it without um, pregnancy bandaging and all that kind of stuff? I put this in here because I, I saw it in a EMS cat or magazine the other, the other day. I thought it was really interesting. Your whole blood volume for your entire body can be fit inside your pelvis. Somebody could bleed out their entire blood volume into their pelvis and, and not show many outward signs. So if you've got somebody who's taken a shot around that area or taken a big fall and has you know, a possible pelvic fracture, start thinking about these things. If two minutes down the road they start getting pale and losing consciousness, that's a good sign that they're bleeding out internally um, and we need to get them moving. The hemostatic agents, you guys have quick clot in some vest or cars, it's kind of sporadic um, throughout, but we're working on getting um, the Cellox. This is the, the applicator version they sell um, that goes into a penetrating wound so I can inject it in there. Um, what I like more than this is just the bag with the powder in it. Um, because it can be used in so many different areas, um, especially for that junctional hemorrhaging. You've got a big open wound, dump it in there, put pressure on there, and be done with it. This stuff works um, very, very well. Here's a little video of military testing on. This is what the military switched to after quick clot. Quick clot still works. It works good. It has a little bit of disadvantages, but this stuff works better, and it's cheaper. No bacon was harmed in the making of this. This allows blood pressure to drop. However, to make it more challenging, Salox is used after only 90 seconds. The pooled blood is locked away, and the contents of the Now, you're not going to have gauze on you, but try and get as much blood out of that wound as you can before you dump that stuff in. That was a problem they had with quick clot, the older version. Um, I, from what I know, the newer quick, quick clot doesn't have that problem as bad, but it, would, it was exothermic. It would burn the person trying to hold pressure as much as it would the patient. got to treat a wound and then move this person from A to B, this stuff's awesome. Don't pull the clot out. <laughs> this is just for educational purposes. sub-zero temperatures, it'll clot um, heparinized blood or people that are on blood thinners, um, which has applications for us on the ambulance, you know, to, to help with stuff like that. The biggest thing is when I have these junctional areas, 
or anywhere really with a big wound and I'm having trouble stopping it with the direct pressure, make sure, I have a laser thing in the middle of the message. Make sure we're inside the wound, that we're not just holding pressure over top because it's just going to keep bleeding in there. Like the wound on the pig, so how deep that was, we have to get to the source of bleeding at the bottom of the wound as far as we can in there um, to pack it in there as much as we can and then put pressure on it. That will put pressure internally. Um, I was talking with um, the Port Huron PD today, and I said, listen, you, you don't carry gauze in your pockets, you don't carry an Israeli in your pocket, and that's fine, I don't expect you to, you've got enough stuff on your belt and in your pockets, but think um, on your feet a little bit, if I'm helping out somebody and they've got, the scenario I gave them was a gunshot wound um, right here in the groin and massive bleeding and, and they had a pretty good sized wound, so what do you have available to you to, to, to pack in there and stop that bleeding? Clothing. Exactly. As I said, you all carry knives. You're going to have to expose the wound anyways. Cut the guy's pant leg off and shove it in the wound. Cut the guy's shirt off or a piece of the shirt, shove it in the wound. It'll work. Is the surgeon going to be happy about it? No, that's not my concern. He makes the big bucks, that's his problem, okay? Anything. The cleanest thing you've got possible, but whatever will work. If you've got an Israeli and you've got to cut the plastic piece off and shove the, the gauze in there, whatever. Stick something in there as far as you can and then put pressure on it. Well, ideally you'd want to go with the clot stuff Yeah, first. if you've got and the powder, bandage, whatever. oh my gosh, yeah. If you've got the powder, use that stuff, because that, that stuff's slick. Um, I used it on the stabbing over in St. Paul, and the guy really didn't need it, I just wanted to use it. Um, I wanted to test it out and see how it worked, but I talked to Dr. Paul at Port Huron Emergency Room, and he said that stuff was amazing. He said it, it stopped, you know, he said we pulled it out in one big piece, we stitched them up, your body will absorb any leftover stuff in there, it's just a protein. 48 hours your body breaks it down and you pee it out. It's no big deal, it's not toxic, I mean, this stuff's amazing, and it's cheap compared to um, Quick Clot and some other um, versions. Two five eight. Um, facial Got a hold of trauma. Andy. You just call me there. <laughs> yeah. With facial and, uh, trauma, and, and in that area. if your enemy's not aiming at your mass, your body mass, or, or your, your main area, they're going to aim at your face. I mean, they're criminals. They don't care. If they can't get here, it's, it's going to your face. That's what they they want to do. So if you've got some with facial injury, gunshot wound, whatever, if they can sit up and control their own airway, let them do it. Just because somebody's hurt doesn't mean we have to lay everybody down and say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. It's okay. Let them sit up, let them control their own airway. Okay. Don't, don't dump a bunch of clotting powder in the wound there. It's going to clog up his airway and you're going to end up suffocating them. But, um, let them do it if they can. 43. A little quick like you died on me. If you haven't already, can you call them all security and let them know? Um, the halo dressings. Or the, the chest seals. Those are also in the... Yeah, the uh, chest. Yeah, there is the, they're in the kit there. The package, when they're inside the package, you can roll it, you can fold it, do whatever you want to it. I contacted the company, said, hey, the pouches we want to put these in are a lot smaller than this gigantic package, what can we do? They said, you're not going to degrade it at all if you want to fold it. Three, seven, three, three, seven, three, but inside, there's two of them. Yeah, any penetrating trauma. Gunshot wound, stab wound, whatever, from the neck to the navel, you should get one of these. Okay? Because when you breathe, your diaphragm drops down, pulls negative pressure on your lungs, and draws your air in through your nose and your mouth. And so when you do that, if I've got penetrating trauma anywhere, even if it's not a big, huge, gaping wound, it can pull air or pull blood from that area into that chest cavity. And then I start to fill up the chest cavity with air, blood, whatever, put pressure on the heart, pressure on the lungs, um, and create a lot of problems. So, if I can seal it up, seal it up with this thing, it, it, it can't pull that through there. Is it, is it going to pull some blood in there? Probably. Um, but it just lessens the chance of making it much, much worse. Um, but you guys can look at those, peel it back, feel how sticky it is. These things stick to sweat, sweaty, uh, victim, bloody, rain, whatever, they'll stick and they'll re-stick a few times. 
Um, they're designed off of the defib pads that we use for a cardiac monitor, the same type of um, thick adhesive where if I have to peel it back, reposition it, whatever, stick it back down, it'll still work. It'll still stick to them. Guys with the man sweater, it'll still stick to them, right? Yes, come on. Uh, this just shows the difference between, you know, the, the new old thorax and if you've got a big open sucking chest wound. Okay, if you've got a big open wound that's actually pulling in air, that just makes it more obvious of that's what I need to put on there. But like I said, any penetrating trauma to the torso, uh, anything between the neck and the, the navel, I would put one on. A little video to show you what a sucking chest wound looks like. What it sounds like. White male. Blue on blue. Black hat. Okay. That's his lung moving underneath there. Clear. Initial first layer of skins, that's the muscle tissue, and then the lung underneath moving. I don't know how he's even alive. Uh, from where that wound is, uh, that, that's absolutely amazing. I don't think he's alive for, very, for a lot longer. I think that's why they started videotaping. Let's get a videotape of this because they're really not concerned about letting that thing be uh, open. Yeah. That's what it looks like when it's treated. You can see it moving, still trying to pull in the air, uh, but when it's sealed up, it prevents that. And it allows the, the lung to potentially start reinflating. You have to monitor these for a while because, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes or so from what I've been told. If I seal up a, a chest wound, you know, 20 minutes later, this guy starts saying, man, I'm having a really hard time breathing. He might be collecting air in there, and it's pressurized in there now. Peel this thing back, burp the wound, burp some of that air out of it, put it back over. If he starts breathing better, that was the problem. You have to watch him every 10, 20 minutes, say, hey, how's your breathing doing? Oh, man, it's getting real hard to breathe again. Burp it. Pull that dressing back, let some of the air out, um, and burp it. What we do in the ambulance is we basically put a three and a half inch needle right through the chest wall to let the air out if need be. If they don't have a, a big open wound that we can burp out like that. Um, let me see. Last thing I kind of covered, just blood loss and shock. Just real quick, we'll, we'll burn through this. Um, it's just a visual to see. How much blood can I lose and what can I expect this person to start acting like, reacting, or some of the signs and symptoms that they're going to have. Five liters of blood, our whole blood volume, it's five liters. If I lose half a liter, that's what you give uh, when, you, when you donate blood, half a liter. Basically, no difference. No difference whatsoever. Your body handles that just fine. Uh, within 48 hours, your body, or 24 hours, your body will replace that blood volume. No big deal. A liter gone. Really only change here is um, the heart rate has increased. The body's realized something's going on. The heart rate started to increase um, because of the oxygen demand on the body. The, the body has an oxygen demand because what carries the oxygen is leaking out. Liter and a half gone. Okay, the person's starting to get anxious, and, and that's not just because they're bleeding. Their body's starting to set off hormones and that that is, is ramping up their, their thought process. It's pure adrenaline, okay? And they're starting to get a little anxious about that. Um, their pulse starts to get a little weak in their arm. Heart rate's still increasing. Um, their blood pressure might be dropping now. It just depends on your, your size, your physical you know, fitness, all sorts of things. Uh, but the big thing is, is their, heart, their respiratory rate is starting to, to increase. Okay, we normally breathe 12 to 20 times a minute, and, and this person with a liter and a half gone has already increased it to 30. Are they going to die? Probably not, as long as we get the bleeding stopped. Two liters of blood gone, they're starting to become confused. They're starting to become weak. Um, their, their heart rate is, is, is steadily climbing. Their respiratory rate is going through the roof. 35, more than 35 times a minute, that's crazy. You guys have probably seen that in medicals before you walk in, somebody's going, <sighs> that's not normal. If it's from a trauma or from bleeding and somebody starts breathing like that, we are very, very late in the game. We've got to stop the bleeding now um, or it's, it's not going to be too much longer. Are they going to die? Maybe. Depends when we get it stopped. Two and a half liters of blood, 
Most likely unconscious again. Depends on your medical history, your size, your physical fitness, blah, 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 blah. It just depends. The guy in the photo from the Boston Marathon bombing, he had at least two liters of blood out on the ground. He was still conscious, okay? Just depends. Uh, most likely you won't have a radial pulse because your blood pressure has dropped so low, um, it's not perfusing out to the end of your, your arms anymore. Heart rate is still steadily increasing, 140 or more. Um, blood pressure is tanking, um, and the respiratory rate is just going through the roof. This person is moments from death. Are they going to die? Probably. Half your blood volume. You lose half your blood volume, uh, very, very hard to turn around. I can start an IV on you, I can push tons and tons of fluid in you, which will help with pressure, but that fluid can't carry oxygen. And if you don't get blood to carry the oxygen, um, you won't last very long. Uh, lastly here, this just shows um, kind of a good indicator. If I want to assess somebody really quick to find out, okay, how bad are they, how bad off is it? Okay, besides the, the blood I can see on the ground, the best indicators in the tactical environment is mental status um, and, and the radio pulse. If they're with it and they understand what's going on in the situation that's happening, okay, mentally, we're there. If I got a radio pulse, I know I have a blood pressure of at least 80 over something. Cool, I'm good with that. There's my baseline. I want to at least keep that. If I walk up on this guy and he's starting to get a little spacey on me, and I can't feel a pulse here, we're really late in the game. It's time to get this guy uh, moving immediately. Uh, lastly, in the MARCH acronym, we kind of progress through. The last thing is just hypothermia. With our burn patients and eviscerations, we have to make sure that we keep these people warm. I'm sure you guys have like emergency blankets, something like that, in, in your cars or whatever. Um, anything. Keep them warm. Other than that, that's about it. Any questions on the bleeding control? Like I said, don't worry about uh, being fancy, being perfect. Just stop the bleeding any way, shape, or form. And we'll take care of everything after that. If I want to make it look pretty before I get to the ER, that's my that's my goal. Okay, that would be my job. You guys, is to stop the bleeding as soon as possible, and we're fine. Cool. All right. Okay, I'm back over here. So this is yeah, it's just serrated at the end to push all that powder through. That's it. I mean, it, it works awesome. Welcome to the CAT Tourniquet Video Tutorial, one-handed application to upper extremity. Insert the wounded limb through the loop formed by the band. Apply tourniquet proximal to the bleeding site. Pull the band tight and securely fasten the band back on itself. Adhere the band around the limb. Do not adhere past the rod clip. Twist the rod until bright red bleeding has stopped and the distal pulse is eliminated. Place the rod inside the clip, locking it in place. Check for bleeding and absence of distal pulse. Adhere the band over the rod, inside the clip, and fully around the limb. Secure the rod and band with the strap. Prepare the patient for transport and reassess. For more information about the CAT tourniquet or any NAR products, please visit www.narescue.com or call 888-689-6277. Welcome to the CAT Tourniquet Video Tutorial, Application to Lower Extremity. Route the band around the limb and pass the red tip through the inside slit of the buckle. Pull the band tight. Apply tourniquet proximal to the bleeding site. Pass the red tip through the outside slit of the buckle. The friction buckle will lock the band in place. 
Pull the band very tight and securely fasten the band back on itself. When the band is pulled tight, no more than three fingers will fit between the band and the limb. Twist the rod until bright red bleeding has stopped and the distal pulse is eliminated. Place the rod inside the clip, locking it in place. Check for bleeding in absence of distal pulse. If bleeding is not controlled, consider additional tightening of the tourniquet or the use of a second tourniquet, side by side and proximal to the first, to eliminate the distal pulse. Secure the rod inside the clip with the strap. Prepare the patient for transport and reassess. Record the time of application. For more information about the CAT tourniquet or any NAR products, please visit www.narescue.com or call 888-689-6277. Introducing Celox, the revolutionary new hemostat. The following demonstration shows Celox being tested on a deep arterial bleed. The femoral artery is severed and then left to bleed. The industry standard test for hemostatic agents is to let the wound bleed for a full three minutes. This allows blood pressure to drop. However, to make it more challenging, Celox is used after only 90 seconds. The pooled blood is mopped away and the contents of the Celox packet are poured directly into the wound. Celox is safe to use on the entire body, including head, neck and chest wounds. Compression is then applied for five minutes, in accordance with standard protocols for arrest of haemorrhage. Celox is simple and safe to use, and no specialist training is required. Celox is not exothermic and will not burn the casualty or first responder. As Celox works independently of normal clotting factors, it's able to work in very cold or hypothermic conditions and also clot heparinized blood. After compression, the wound is examined and any excess powder wiped away. The tensile strength of the wound is rigorously tested to simulate transportation of the casualty over very rough terrain. Even after this tough test, Celox prevents re-bleeding. The removal of the clot is simple and the blood cells that have locked together are easy to clean up. This allows for a more permanent surgical repair to be carried out when appropriate. Remember these exceptional features. Celox works independently of normal clotting factors. It's therefore effective in hypothermic conditions and able to clot heparinized blood. Celox provides rapid and strong clot formation and is effective for severe arterial bleeds. Unlike some rival hemostats, Celox is not exothermic, making it safe for both casualty and first responder. Celox has a three-year shelf life and needs no specialist storage conditions. Celox has not only outperformed its rivals in clinical testing, it's also less expensive. Celox, the revolutionary new hemostat. It controls life-threatening bleeding fast.